So, first question, I suppose, is what is a publisher? The first thing we start with what I call the DNA of, of the music industry, which is the song itself. It could be the lyric. I, have, I represent people who are only lyricists. I also represent people who only write music. And actual artifacts that we call a song is two of those things. So, obviously, a lot of what we actually do is involved in putting words and music together to form songs. But you can make money from instrumentals and so on. But we are only involved in the composition itself, not the recording. It could mean trying to get someone to record it. So if I'm a manager, someone writer like Rob Davis or Kathy Dennis, I might actually try and get an artist like Kylie Minogue to record one of my songs. Their great hit being, Can't Get You Out of My Head. So, but equally, we're going to represent bands. So Snow Patrol obviously have a publisher, and they're signed to a record company that's quite different. They're signed to Fiction Records, which is part of Universal, but they have a separate deal through Big Life Music with Universal Publishing, but they're two very different deals. So if you're a creator, particularly one who actually releases your own recordings, you're dealing with two primary things, the composition itself and the recording itself. They're two totally different rights. And our main role is, it is the exploitation of music through securing <coughs> recordings of the material, maybe getting uses of music on, on television and film. Um, Ross and I were actually at the uh, LA Sync conference uh, back in April, and that's part and parcel of what you would expect a publisher to do, to be looking and meeting people who can actually get pieces of music we control into um, TV and film. It's a fantastic revenue source. Also pushing for performances of music. Some publishers actually do, even in this day and age, do use radio plugins. They actually use plugins in order to try and encourage the performance of certain um, material that they actually control. But primarily you would say the pr and main one is getting recordings of the material, because that's the simplest way to get the material out to the general public, and also placing the use of music within television and film. But what you also want from a publisher is you want them to be able to collect and distribute the income they actually uh, is generated. Now, I don't know how many people uh, in this room are members of PRS. Okay, so you know the rigmarole is pretty straightforward. You register your song, and then what? Wait. You wait. Okay. What happens if, if there's a mistake? I don't distrust the organisation, but we are dealing with complex computer systems that travel the world. Well, the vast majority of independent local radio stations historically do not pay out uh, everything that they, they, uh, they actually broadcast. Because it's simply not, the amount of money generated from the use from the radio station is not sufficient to cover the cost of distribution. I, I think as I, I see this part and parcel of my role to actually make sure that we don't just register the songs, make sure they're registered correctly, the right title. You know, if you've got a, a title called Love Song, how many different love songs do you think are in the PRS database to get paid? Or your song is you register it under one title, I Love You, but actually on the record it is I Love You, the letter, not Y O U. Now, these are computer systems. They don't guess. They can't go, I think actually that's the one they mean. It just pays out on what it sees in terms of data. So the number of mismatches we see is very, very common. Particularly in the UK, we have, I'm going to uh, say and argue, and no one's ever challenged me on this yet, the, the best creator's rights anywhere in the world. That is the rights that protect the creator of a musical work. We have the best form of protection, mainly because of case law. Some writers before you guys have gone to court and actually challenged you know, some very sharp practices and actually managed to get, come up with a system, which means that some writers not only generally don't sign off uh, on, on stupid deals. They generally understand, and I hope you guys will understand by now today, the benefit of actually owning your own rights and only ever signing or licensing uh, rights out when you actually need to, where there's a business purpose. If we'd held this uh, seminar 30 years ago, I would have said, publishers always own the song. Today, we generally have a license from the songwriters, and that's a very healthy relationship. The system does work to protect the creator um, foremost. So the publishers that are out there in the business generally are there to, uh, they know they have to have the right kind of relationship with the writers to be able to prosper and succeed. So 
if you were signed as a writer to Warner Chapel, Universal, EMI, you would be appointed an a and representative, and that would be your go-to person within that, within that kind of company. Um, the answer, well, the question I suppose most of you might have is, what exactly does each of them really do that you need to know? The principal thing that you need to know about the A&R is their function isn't just to actually try and help you get a record deal. It might, if you're a job in songwriter, be setting up co-writes. It might actually be uh, helping to place you with um, looking for licensing deals. So you might have a UK release and you might be looking for releases internationally. It could be a whole gamut of different things. Um, the one thing I would draw your attention to, something that some writers tend not to take uh, much care of, but it's a relationship that's very much worth um, developing, is that with the copyright department, to make sure your songs are registered properly. Um, I have a writer whose name is Steve Edwards. How many Steve Edwards do you think there are? One, two, a dozen? We counted 3,000. Steve Edwards that exists around the world. What do you think the chances are of his money going astray? So I realised just what a problem this was just by looking at the data. I said, we've got to really nurture this. So having that relationship with Universal means that I can make sure that the songs are actually registered correctly by using his full legal name. If your name is common, and even if it's not uncommon, it actually makes a lot of sense to use your full legal name when you become a member of any collection society. And more importantly, make sure everybody who uses your material uses the same name. We found one of Steve's songs being paid to uh, another Steve Edwards, and a lot of money went straight back, 30,000 euros from France, went to a Steve Edwards who died in 1967. Now, what the chances are of getting it back from his successes remains to be seen, but the fact remains you've got to be vigilant. The music industry is about the amalgamation of technology and music. Technology changes the industry, and it's our role to then try and play catch up. And every time it changes, we have to uh, create another way of actually dealing with it. And as early as 1914, it was a pretty obvious then that you couldn't collect all the money owed to you on your own either as an individual publisher or as an individual creator. You had to get this other thing that could do it for you. And that's the year that PRS and ASCAP, the American version of PRS, were set up. And, and the idea from the very beginning was that societies would represent not just composers, not just authors, but publishers, all three together. They we're all in the game together. But I think we have to get, uh, get real here. You know, copyright laws change so much. I think we reach the limit of how far we can go with you know, enforcing our rights. And those rights, by and large, are still respected. But I think suing people for using a piece of music in a piece of user-generated video doesn't actually do us any favours. By and large, though, the technology is being beneficial. PRS in 2007 licensed YouTube was the first organisation to actually say, we've got the systems and the will to actually licence YouTube to make sure that everything you do, and that's our mandate, is to actually try and make sure publishers, creators, and collective societies all understand a simple vision. Whenever music's used, and as a commercial game, we should get paid for that. That's a simple mantra.